Alright guys, uh, we're going to get back to this email receipt polar bot development.
Hej Fuske. Hvad vil han gøre? I've been good, how have you been? Okay, uh... Uh, for me, I'll say this evening. Crud. Didn't fix it. Dang it. Still getting an error. Setting registry key value.
Okay. That's probably it. Uh, you're supposed to have cheat days, really. It's okay to have cheat days after dieting 10 days. But, yeah, you should probably have, like, one cheat meal, but not, like, the whole day cheat. I actually had a huge binge eating day today. Nobox bought me forty dollars worth of food, and I ate uh, half of it. It was like three meals. Bought me a pizza burger. Uh, sweet potato fries, pancakes, eggs, French toast, biscuits, and gravy. No box is trying to spoil me. Or turn me fat so you can make fun of me more. <laughs> My favorite part of the day, uh my afternoon. Okay. Wait, was that the bug? Doubt it. Oh. Alright, so if a program opens another program, the program it opened doesn't have administrator privileges. It can't set the registry values. So it can't set itself to auto start a startup. So I need the calling program to set the secondary program it launches to start up on computer startup. Because the calling program, the original program that's being opened, is the one that has administrative privileges. That's why I'm getting errors, and at least that's my theory. Okay.
That's good, Fusky. Means your stomach started shrinking because you're doing smaller portions. That's the key. <laughs> I don't use Java Beam. What am I coding here? I am coding uh, adding a program to the registry, meaning the auto start list. So every time your computer starts up, the program runs. But what program I, am I working on within the larger goal of this project? I'm building an email receipt polar bot. It's going to attach itself to Gmail servers ask Gmail what my latest email is once every couple minutes. As soon as I get a new email, it's going to read my email and decide whether to uh, copy the pertinent emails into my receipts folder. So let's say I get a sale of an item. Well, it can go in and copy in the amount of the sale, the date of the sale, and the transaction number into my sales receipts folder and my sales tallying log so that all my record keeping can then become automated. Yeah, so in order to get email from Gmail servers, it will need to uh, send a HTTP POST command to Gmail servers and then get a response from Gmail servers.
Uh, I think skipping breakfast is actually a good thing to do. But, I know that's not popular opinion. That's an easy way to cut calories, just skip some deals that are, aren't too hard to skip. Alright, so, I hope this will fix it. I gotta declare this extra bullion. It should work, right? Haha! <laughs> no more error, boys! Oh man, Google saved me here. <laughs> That's amazing, guys. I solved my problem. So, yeah. Um, the issue was, like I said, if you try to set it in the registry after a different... Pro so, I launch one program, and it's supposed to launch all these other programs. And if one of these other programs wants to set itself as an auto-start program in the registry... Windows denies it and crashes the whole program. Crashes it. Um, so I want the main program that launches all the other little programs to also add all those other little programs to my auto start list. Because that main program is the only program that is given ad administrator privileges. That's so cool. To actually fix a bug and understand what caused it is very important to me and, and just really satisfying. It's one thing to fix a bug and not really know what happened, but to be able to explain what was wrong, it's just like... makes you feel like not an idiot. I don't know, it's just really important to me. Nothing worse than having a program just crashing, just shutting down. It's like, oh, what is wrong here? Okay, we're here. So I, I was able to cross that off my to-do list, guys. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, hold on. I found where I need to be. Next. Uh... Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to resume typing up some totally new code next. I fixed the only bug we had, and now we get to go back to adding more features to our email receipt polar bot. We are back. Use the bathroom. Alright, boys. I'm back. I'm excited because that food I ate earlier, it really took my energy away I feel like when you eat such a heavy meal like that such high calories 6,000 calories whatever of like real just heavy crazy food your body tries to digest that and most of your energy goes into digestion so the temptation was great just to take a nap or just relax and shut my mind off watch TV but um somehow I pulled through it and I just 
started programming and and I fixed that bug in what 10 minutes and now we're off to the races typing the next thing and we're making real progress here I'm I'm very pleased because I could have easily ended this stream early very easily I feel like it I'm like so tired but that win that bug fix it just has me very motivated now so on the one hand I'm motivated on the other hand I'm I'm sleepy I'm sleepy and lazy, but the motivation side is winning, and that's what matters in the long run is that we we're able to put in solid hours. So let's get on to the next thing. Uh, man, I don't even. Okay, so so far, uh, we're now able to have our main program launch this email receipt polar program, and. If it sees another copy of itself already open on the computer, it shuts itself down. Or it shuts that copy down or whatever. Yeah, it shuts that copy down. So it's the only copy. It launches a window, which it then hides. Uh, so why does it launch a window then? I don't really know, actually. It's a good question. Alright, and it's been added to the registry by the other program. Big deal. So that just means that it's going to start up every time we start a computer. Because it's something I want to run as like a service. I want it to run at all times. Just checking my email day and night. Not even something I think about. Whenever it sees an email of a certain type, it will just handle it. Specifically emails regarding sales. Anytime I make a sale or even get a donation from Twitch, it's going to see that email and it's going to copy in the the transaction number and the date and all that stuff into my receipts folder, creating a TXT file containing that information. And it will also add that sale to my earnings tallying log which then at the end of the year I have a program that can go through and add up all the earnings every single transaction for the year in different categories and give me totals so I can see how much money I made in eBay sales, how much money I made in Twitch tips, how much money I made in um, product sales outside of eBay, that type of thing. And then I can find out my total earnings figures at the end of the year for tax reasons. So anyways, um, all this has the goal of automating record keeping. Record keeping is a substantial portion of my day-to-day -day life. I end up spending a lot of time just copying down receipts of sales and pasting that information in the appropriate places in my records. It's a lot of work. So we're streamlining and automating all that. We're automating our bookkeeping. So I won't need an accountant, and I don't have to be my own accountant. I'm going to have digital accountants. And eventually, I'm going to automate my taxes, my tax preparation. I'm going to create my own tax preparation software that will automatically go into my records, pull everything, and fill out my tax forms all automatically. It's going to be amazing. So, you know, this is what I'm talking about, improving productivity, just streamlining and automating everything. That way, we can focus on things that are more worthy of our time. So I need to just think right now, what's my next move? Um, Alright, what I'm thinking right now is how does a program how does a program hold on
All right. I'm thinking about how login systems work. Basically, the first thing you do when you want to log into something is you go to the login page. Let me open up Internet Explorer real quick and see what happens if I go to gmail.com from there? I don't think I should be logged in or anything. Huh. Wait, let me think further. Um, okay. So let's say I have the login page. When somebody logs in, I set a PHP variable. Or, or it creates a PHP session on the server. It sets a variable like logged in equals true. That variable is tied to that user. To their connection or their session. From that point forward, any page they go to, the first thing a page asks is, are you logged in to that session? Or logged into a session? Let me, let me look into my PHP code. Uh, Okay, the first thing I can't show you guys all this stuff, I don't think. There might be some sensitive information. Uh all right, so generally when somebody logs into a website, they go to some type of sign in page and they enter in a form a HTML form form name equals login action equals account sign in dot PHP method equals post and then in the form they'll it will have email and then a box that has input type text name user email Password, input type, text, name, password. And then in, input type, submit, value, login. And the submit will show a button in HTML. So they enter their username and password, they click submit. And then when they click submit, the form action is to post. So it will send an HTTP post command to the server. And to specifically the server page whose action is defined as being that server page, account sign in dot PHP in my case for a website I made. Account sign in dot PHP says session start. Session start in PHP starts a new session and that session sustains itself 
throughout their entire interaction with your website from that point forward. So all kinds of variables stored about them, like their email and their password, remain active and retrievable during their session. Session destroy will actually start a fresh session. Session underscore start. I want to read more about PHP sessions now. Just to make sure I'm very clear. Session start creates a session or resumes the current one based on a session identifier passed via a get or post request. Or passed via a cookie. When session start is called or when a session auto starts, PHP will call the open and read session save handlers. Okay, so what I'm gathering is when you use PHP, that's a server-side language. HTML is a browser-side, user-side language. And the user gets their form, they post it. The information from the form gets sent to the server through the post command. The server retrie retrieves that information it uses, it uses session start to generate a cookie for the user. That cookie has a session ID stored on the user's computer. When they go to another page during that session, they enter in some stuff, send that to the server again the server will say session start again and it will look for that same cookie I guess. As long as it finds the same cookie it knows you're the same person and you're currently logged in. That's my understanding here.
I mean, what I want to do is, okay, let's say I use a browser, I create a new tab, I go to gmail.com, and I'm just logged in. Let's say I logged out, and I removed all accounts, I go to gmail.com, it will ask me to enter in uh, information or create a new account. Because there's no saved cookie indicating I'm logged in that way. Now, I don't want my software email receipt pull or bot to have to use Google Chrome or Internet Explorer to access my email. I want it to talk directly to the Gmail server. So it's important for me to understand how the user connects to the server in a browser because I'm basically creating my own browser. That's what it comes down to. I'm creating a browser. Um, so it helps to know what the back end is doing. So I'm thinking that in order for gmail.com to treat my program as a browser, my program has to present itself as being a browser, as being a user's browser. It needs to access the web page pretending to be a browser. It's not going to have a cookie. It's. Ugh. Oh gosh. <laughs> Maybe I should just look at how to do this. Um. No. Well, then my program has to be able to store a cookie. It's not computer fraud and abuse. I'm creating my own browser. Is Google Chrome a computer fraud and abuse? No. I'm creating a browser. All right, I'm going to try it. Uh, oh. There we go. Okay, it looks like you put the cookie into your HTTP request. Interesting.
and that's part of a header. Add quick header. Huh. Very cool. That's ridiculous. Gmail was created by Google. Google's entire business, Google.com, was created by using a web spider. A web spider is a software program that will go to web pages, read everything on the page, and then find all the links and then go to all those links and read everything on those pages and basically download the whole internet and then try to organize the entire internet and all the web pages with all the text on the whole internet into an organized file system and then enable people to Google search and then feed up the page that most matches their search query. Um, I'm creating that spider. There's nothing illegal about that. It's not illegal to have a desktop application access websites. It's not going to need to send any more handshakes than anybody else. My browser will have built-in ad blocking actually, it's great. No, I never said I'm going to bypass authentication. I was discussing how login systems work. The first thing my browser needs to do is go to the Gmail login page, enter in my real password and username, which I have, and then that page needs to send back, I guess, a header that contains a cookie. And that cookie will be something that I need to send with all future requests for any other pages, any other accessing of any pages in my email. That cookie stores a, a variable in session information, time of day, and some kind of special code that indicates that I am somebody who logged in in the past, they know who I am, they already permitted me, and as long as I want to continue this, I can continue accessing all the information that's protected by my username and password. I'm not bypassing anything. My program just is acting as a user. It's acting as a registered agent and it's just logging in. And I'm just processing how all that works and what's involved in. And now I know that cookies have nothing to do with saving a TXT file with cookie information. Cookies are something that just needs to be added in the header of all your HTTP requests. That's very useful to know. I'm so excited, man. I feel like I'm getting it now. Yeah, everything I'm doing, meme, is completely above board. I'm not trying to hack anything. I'm just creating a software program that can 
access websites that I'm a registered user of, logging into my accounts, getting information, and storing that information, whether it's emails or whatever else, or orders or whatever, storing that or notifying me of that. So let's say, here's another example of one thing I'm going to want it to ultimately do. Let's say I have um, an account on a 3D printing service website. And a customer places an order. Oh my gosh, I just got an order. That's great, right? But I'm sleeping. Well, my bot can log into my 3D printing services website account and check periodically, maybe once every 10 minutes, to see if I have an order. If it sees I got an order, it will quickly um, write a message to that user. Um, Larry is currently sleeping. This is Larry's assistant. Um, he will be getting to you as soon as he wakes up in approximately four hours. Um, thank you for your order, and we hope to work with you very soon. And then they'll be happy seeing, like, oh, wow, he has an assistant that is right on top of things. Um, and then on some 3D printing services websites, they actually reward you if you if you respond to your customer's new order inquiry within five minutes or something. They consider you to be a top-notch 3D printing services provider. Whereas if I were sleeping, they'd punish me and consider me a lower quality provider because I didn't respond to the new order within a certain frame time frame. Uh, I do video game botting, but all of this has nothing to do with that. I, I can tell you guys all the goals right now of this coding project. Right now, my only goal is to access my emails. And uh, every time I get a sale, it will see the sales email and it will record that sale in my record keeping for tax reasons. But future uses of this bot will be, um, let's say, let's say I want to tweet out something like, "Hey everyone, I I just finished um, creating a, a fume extractor for my soldering iron kit. A video should be coming out soon on YouTube covering the project. I'm very excited to have this. Let's say I want to tweet that. Well, I don't just want to tweet it on Twitter. I want to tweet it on Google Plus, Twitter." Facebook, my company website, um, Reddit, Twitch, my YouTube status page, like Tumblr, maybe some DIY page I have on DIYHowTo.com or just whatever. Like, if I want to say something, I want to blast it across 30 different social media accounts. But I'm not going to sit there and log into 30 different social media websites to just to say some crap and copy paste it. That's a lot of work. But I can create a blaster bot that will tweet out things to all the different places, including like Instagram, like, you know, all the top social media, Snapchat. And that is powerful. You, you reach a wider audience. You know, I can go in examples all day, but the point is I need the the ability for my software to be able to interact with the website, to be able to send out information and receive information. It will really be useful. Um, also, if I ever put out a video for YouTube, I would like to have a bot take that video I just rendered and automatically upload it to YouTube. So I don't even have to go to YouTube's upload page myself. My bot will do it for me. And while it's at it, it will also upload the video to Vimeo.com, Daily Mo DailyMotion.com or whatever, uh, Hulu.com, I don't know, all, all the top 
other video sharing sites? Why just stick to YouTube? Twitch? So that way, all my videos will be automatically uploaded to dozens of websites. Now, would I do that myself? No, it's just too much work. Everything's just too much work. All that self-promotion and cross-posting. It's just not something that I can force myself to do. But if I create a bot that does it, will shoot, then I'll do it. And I'll just get way more impact every time I publish anything. I can even upload the video to my Facebook and upload the video to my website. So, yeah. That's exactly the type of thing I want to create, Poo Poo. An interface which gives me combined feeds, chats, and access to all my bank accounts and accounts. Yeah, that's exactly what my my bot's going to do, that type of thing. Not necessarily bank accounts, but um, feeds and chats I think is so important. I want it to go into... Okay, for my robot project, I posted on 20 different robotics and technology forums the project. And I'm supposed to post updates to all 20 of those different websites every time I would do something big on the robot. And I've done some big stuff on the robot and had some important announcements, but I never bothered to update every single forum because it's just too much work. But if I had a bot, it could do that for me. That bot could also go into each and every one of those 20 or 30 forums and look for latest responses or questions from users on each of those forums and create a feed with all of that so I can respond in one place on 20 different websites and all this stuff and maybe even my Twitter and my Facebook all my different social medias for all my different companies and it's just all in one place and whenever somebody writes something I can quickly respond and go through stuff because I don't want to log into 20 different social medias for each of my five or six companies to check for any messages and stuff it's just too much work so I do need a, a conglomerator a aggregator of all this stuff so I can just quickly see everything and respond to everything all in one place I'm sure people would pay for something like that, but I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if I can share this technology. <laughs> I mean, because then if I if I start sharing the technology, that means I'm creating a business. I don't know if I want any new businesses. This is all just meant to make my life a little easier. But uh, yeah, I guess if you guys really like what I end up with, I guess I could. I could sell it to you. That'd be kind of nice, I guess, to make some easy money on the side. But I never really meant for this to be a product for people to use commercially. Okay, data mining is not illegal. Um, what do you think Google.com does? They crawl the entire internet, saving all of the data on the entire internet. And then they catalog and categorize all that data. And then if you type any words you can imagine into their search engine, um, it will go through all the words and all of the data on the entire internet looking for matches. And it will give millions of results. And it will feed those links to those pages to you in a prioritized order. So if data mining is illegal or bad in any way, then Google's the number one culprit because that's what their web spiders do. They mine all the data on the entire internet. There's nothing illegal about it. Another thing I want to do is data mine the entire patent, every patent ever made in history. Um, one thing I really like to do for for a side hobby is just go through patents year by year every patent just glancing through them looking at the pictures reading the interesting ones because I feel like someday I might discover some invention that is no longer used today and I could make a business from it or learn some aspect of it to apply it to something I'm inventing or whatever um, so I like reading other people's patents but there is no easy way to browse through patents besides going to a patent website and entering in manually URLs for each patent by patent number. Well, I want my bot to download every patent ever made and make it like a slideshow. And I can just click the right or left arrow to scroll through them very quickly and just look at the pictures and 
and read the information on any of them I think are interesting. And I can just go through very quickly hitting the right arrow. I don't have to load up a web page and wait for it to load. Because the patent servicing web pages load up kind of slow, especially after a while. Uh, the servers will see that you're making a lot of requests and they'll start to slow down the data transfer rate to your IP address if you're using their server too much. So they start capping you and it starts taking like two or three seconds or up to 30 seconds to load a single web page. Eventually they'll just say, um, you have been making too many requests, therefore you can no longer make requests for like a, a couple days or whatever. They'll actually cut you off from using their website anymore after a while. That's happened to me. I don't think I could develop AI that finds interesting patterns. Well, I mean, maybe if I set some rules, like anything that has to do with paint or chemistry, just get rid of it. Yeah, I could, I could probably give it some rules just to show certain types of inventions and just kind of filter out a lot of stuff I'm not interested in. So yeah, that, that actually is not a bad idea. But no, there's nothing illegal about browsing the internet or creating a bot that browses the internet. You don't have to be a, a physical human to do it. You better believe my robots, when my robot army, when they're done, they're going to need to browse the internet to look up things and learn things. And so I need to create the ability to do that using software. Okay, so uh, I already created a HTTP thing in the past. Let me try to find it in my code. I can't show you this part. Uh... Oh, gosh! Check it out, guys! I didn't even realize all this stuff I did. Alright, I'm gonna I can show you this. Alright. Issue post request to server section. So, issue post request to server. First thing you do, activate WinSock server library usage. Once that's done, if server if WinSock library usage activation succeeded, create a socket connection connecting client to server. Client to server socket creation completed. Now remote web server to connect to equals host address to post to. Server to connect to string equals remote web server. Define port and IP address of server we are connecting to. Once host server IP address resolving attempt completed, connect to host server. Connecting to host server succeeded, send post command to server. Sending post command to server, you have post path on host address to post to using HTTP 1.1 user agent we actually add this user agent so this is where we lie and say we are a browser user agent and this is actually not Mozilla Firefox but we say we are user agent Mozilla 5.0 Windows NT RV 41 Gecko Firefox 41 so that's where we lie and make the server think that we are Firefox connecting, but we are not Firefox. We are actually um, just some desktop program. Okay. Host, host address to post to. Data to post to host address string dot length. Okay, and then um, 
so that's where we add the data to post to the host address okay and then we add to the string content length and then content type application www form URL encoded worldwide web form okay accept language ENUS data to post to host address string so then you add your actual data and then here I just output in the console the data we're posting and then here convert it to a constant car character WinSock error code in okay send you use the send command socket connecting client to server and then the huge information line you're sending and then the string length and that send command now connect it, it actually sends information to the server so this will send information to the Gmail server and one piece of information it would be sending would be the cookie uh, so the first thing we'll want to do is send a post command to the Gmail server login page which will contain a completed form data and that form will have my username and password Gmail will respond to us saying the name of our cookie verifying that we have successfully logged in it will give a cookie with a, a user ID string which contains the session variable user ID that's tied to my successful login so it's kinda like a a session password so to speak and then um, from that point forward all communications to them I need to include that temporary password indicating that I am a logged in user and this is who I am and it will identify me and then Oh, I wonder if I need to use HTTPS though because it's like it needs to be a secured post command I bet maybe Alright, so this only sends a post to the server, but it doesn't listen for anything back. So that's not really what we want. We need to create a separate kind of algorithm that does all of this, except we don't want it to use send. We most likely want it to use something else where it's listening as well. <laughs> oh man. Okay, meme, I'm unbanning you because you just made me laugh. Did it work? It should have worked. I don't know. I think I unbanned you. Uh just because I'm smart doesn't mean I know everything. I asked a question that indicates a lack of knowledge. I I only can know what I know. I've never used um, HTTPS with WinSock.
This is all very new to me. But it's going to be pretty easy since I already know how to do a post command. Okay, there's send. Holy crap, there's a lot of stuff here. Okay. Okay. I like that. Uh, so, when we connect to the server, rather than connecting on port 80, I guess we're connecting on port 443. It says, uh, When you connect to the web page, the website will initially send its SSL certificate to your browser. In this case, I'm creating my own browser, so it's going to send the certificate to my browser. Uh, so i got to see how that's going to work out. Maybe the socket itself gets secured. Maybe this is all behind closed doors. When I say connect socket, socket, AFI net, sock stream, IP proto, TCP, I think that would be the part where instead you say like socket of type HTTPS and like oh and then here client service in port htons default port instead of default port we could say like secured port and that will like 
make me an a secured connection. <laughs> uh Beam, I'm gonna manually unban you because you just made me laugh again. But uh if you say Nightbot, it's automatic timeout. Nightbot doesn't like you to speak his name. Kind of like Voldemort. You're not supposed to say Voldemort. You have to say he whose name must not be spoken. Also, I think the F word is in the timeout list as well. Well, we can't say listen right off the bat, because the server would be like, never going to talk to me. So I imagine you use the send command, and then you use the receive command. Let me see, let me learn about the receive command. I imagine you usually use that right after the send command. I have a quick question. Is gmail.com... Yeah, that's HTTPS, okay. Let me check on Internet Explorer. Yep, it's HTTPS all day. Okay, that's good to know. Ooh, cool. The internet service provider contains the data. So if I connect to Gmail's servers with send command, they'll be like, hey, uh, yeah, that's the right login information or whatever. No, no, no. First, they'll be like, hey, yeah, you can connect to our server. And then, so yeah, I would be like, hey, Gmail, are you there? Can I connect? And they'll be like, hey, yeah, you can connect, and then I'll connect. And then I'll be like, hey, Gmail, send me this this specific web page. And they'll be like, uh, like, that's my send command. And then they'll send something back to me. With, like, their response and I need to be able to receive that response so I use the receipt RECV receive function to receive that but my concern was like if I call send and I send something and now I'm waiting to receive and I'm listening what if they sent their response back like really fast and I missed it I didn't call receive fast enough well that's not a concern because whatever their response is will just be held in like a catch and then as soon as I call receive, I'll be able to read what's stored in that catch. So it will just be held there for like a long time. So I don't have to call receive like right away or else I'll miss the message or whatever. It's just going to be kind of hanging out waiting. So that's good to know. And if I call receive too early and Gmail hasn't responded yet, it says that the receive call blocks and waits for the data to arrive. So that's good to know as well.
Alright, I'm really happy with the receive function. Uh, WSA startup? Let's just use startup. I don't want to use WSA. I just want to use startup. Okay, so listen would make you into a server. Receive. Okay, you're looking. You're listening for a incoming connection with listen. Receive. You're already connected. You're listening for a, a data being sent. I see. So listen and receive are a little bit different. But listen is definitely what you do for a server looking to get a connection. I've worked with all of these before. Oh, WSA means asynchronously. We don't need that stuff. Can you use WinSock for secured connections?
I mean, yeah, I'm still working at, I'm trying to figure out how to do HTTP socket communications with the server using a secured connection. I already knew how to do it with an unsecured connection, but not a secured, so... Whew. I like desktops because you don't have to deal with batteries that never last. And they're cheaper for more bang for your buck for better power. But they're harder to liquidate when you want to sell, I think. At least a little bit harder, maybe, because they're heavier. I think there's more demand for laptops. This is going deep as heck. My good grief. I had no idea I was going into something, such a rabbit hole. Oh my goodness. Freaking 10,000 lines of code just to connect to Gmail's server. Just because it's HTTPS. And then... 
I really don't have to deal with saving security, public security certificates, but I, I have to save cookies and stuff and hashes and oh my gosh, this is getting like insane. All this just to have my bot just check my email. This is, this is getting a lot harder than I thought it would be. But, uh, th my next move usually, I, I have a good idea of what's going on. Um, I want to, I don't like the sample code given by Microsoft, obviously. This is crazy looking to me. I don't use all these defines. What the heck are defines? I don't do that. Uh... It's not my coding style, I guess. It looks pretty foreign to me, but if we could just pull up some stuff. Wait, what do you mean? I'm trying to think of how I find a stack exchange guy that's like, hey, I'm trying to create a secure connection. He has all the simple code already written. And then I copy paste it and get it to work. Maybe I have enough information to just try. Okay, so let me uh, do stack exchange. Well, I want to know what to Google, though. Okay. I don't want to use putty! Putty, I'm sure, without even looking into it, is just a library. I don't want a library to do the work for me. I'm already using a library. It's called Winsock. I want to stay low level. I don't want to go high level. I don't want to have a bunch of bloat and extra file size for my final executable and things I don't understand and just hoping everyone can hold my hand because I don't know what to do at a low level. I'd rather talk directly to Windows and cut out the middleman. I don't want all the bugs involved in using a third-party library either. And then constantly have to download their updates and incompatibilities with my version of Windows. If I use an older version of Windows and blah, 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 blah. I don't want to deal with any of that crap. Third-party libraries are suck. Learn to program like a real programmer. Get down and dirty. Program from scratch. No libraries allowed, except libraries that come with your operating system. No dependencies allowed. These are the rules of a real programmer. Uh-oh.
You're telling me nobody does this? There's no questions on it because nobody has tried it. Usually, if you copy a, a important function name, then and you put Stack Exchange in the search query, you'll get some newbie pasting their code, asking what's wrong with it. And if you copy that code, generally, it will work. People that use putty have brains made of silly putty. People with powerful alpha male brains don't need no stinking putty. We make our own putty. The amount of encryption on this is going to be just as high as anything else. I don't believe this crap. So this is my only example to work with? MIT programmers are retards. Compares to me. I don't use GitHub. No. Here we go. What the heck?
Oh, he's three cards. I'm using a secure connection, doesn't matter. I don't need a secure connection library, I'm not an idiot. Only a child would use a library. I will never use PuTTY or any other ser um, service slash library that's not Windows. I only use the Windows API. The only time in hundreds of thousands of lines of code I ever used anything other than Windows API was for a library that creates a window. And I've regretted it ever since, and I eventually want to get rid of that. Because it creates a dependency, you have to download that library. I shouldn't have to download anything when I work on code. I should create my own window using my own code from scratch. I shouldn't use a library to create a window. I felt guilty about it for years and someday I will get rid of that library and implement it myself. <laughs> Only a child needs to hold have their hand held by some retard's library. I use the Windows API straight from the horse's mouth. I don't need no stinking middleman. I don't need to have my hand held like a whiny little child holding a, a sucker in his one hand and the hand of his father in his other hand. I am the father. I don't need my hand held. I'm an alpha male. Putty is for beta males. Alpha males talk directly to Windows. Face your master. You don't need a middleman. Unix is for children. You should create your own operating system. If you don't want to use Windows, create your own operating system. Otherwise, you're just a coward. I'm going to create my own operating system one day. Only children use things like Unix. Alpha males create their own alpha operating system using assembly code. Uh, the Logitech headphones I have are the best I've ever owned. It's amazing.
Patty sounds like an even more lame version of Putty. For little whiny baby girl brats just learning how to program. Real alpha males create their own code from scratch. <laughs> My program's not called shitty! B equals succeeded P SSL client initialize host name. That's how you have to read it in your head when you're reading this stuff. Oh, what a pain in the butt. This guy split his code up into a million files. What a jerk. I like all my code to be in one file. I don't create headers and my entire projects all go in one source file. This guy's got a million files here. Gotta navigate all this cray up.
I don't need a server. The server is going to be Gmail. I told you guys I'm creating an invisible browser that can talk to Gmail securely to check my email. This is bull crap. No, I won't deal with this anymore. I'm done with this guy. Java! I want no stinking Java. No! Hey, I didn't even time you out, meme. Don't get mad at me. That's Snipebot. You two need to learn to behave and get along with one another. I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm not sure
Wait a minute. Hey. This thing doesn't even show secured windsock. Someone patent the online financial transaction system? How can you patent that? Alright, well, I guess the Microsoft example is the best I'm getting here. Huh. Who would have thought? Uh... This is easy. You know what, guys? It's time to start coding. Screw the haters. Okay. We're in there, boys. I just entered some code. So that's the header. And then here's all the stuff we gotta fully comprehend and whatnot. It's a lot, but we'll get it. We'll make it happen, guys. Boom! Eat poop! There are some things I didn't like about the Microsoft documentation, but I'll just change it to be my own personal preferred style or whatever. I can figure it out. Alright, I'm coding a program that can connect to my Gmail account and read my emails. It will then be able to um, identify emails that are sales emails and it will copy the sales transaction number and money earned into my business earnings folder and my earnings tallying log so I don't have to do it which normally I do that so it's basically a, a homemade accountant it's a it's a digital accountant it automates all of my accounting for processing and recording of sales of merchandise that all flow into my email account this is the first of many automated things i want to do that require me having the capability of making my software program connect to the internet not using a web browser sure i could make it open up a copy of Google Chrome and log into my email that way. But I don't want my program using my mouse and keyboard and using my screen to open up a copy of Google Chrome and use computer vision to read Google Chrome. 
I want it to directly communicate through software commands directly to the Gmail servers and be in essence a browser in and of itself not have to use a browser so I'm basically basically creating an invisible web browser uh, I wouldn't call it a calculator I just call it um, a digital assistant bookkeeper This is going to be a challenge. Okay. I am going to be making a game. I'm going to be creating my own game engine from scratch. In fact, some of the things I'm doing here will be reused for the game engine and for my robotics projects. Being able to communicate securely between computers is actually a very important thing to be able to do. Uh, I'll, be ca I'll be creating a cyborg zombie shooter game with first place, first person story mode, campaign mode, solo, and also um, a multiplayer FPS type mode. And I'll be creating another game with those two types of modes, multiplayer and single player. Um, called David from David in the Bible. I think I, my two new YouTube videos cover those two game announcements on my YouTube channel if you want to hear more detail. So I have two games planned. Alright, now I'm trying to think of the overall loop of what this program is going to be doing. Um, 
All right, the program launches itself, or is launched, creates a window, just because why not, and then I would say it connects to Gmail servers, and it searches for an email of a sale. This is my email receipt puller bot. So that would be um, an email whose title is notifi notification of payment received or an email whose title is item number blank instant payment received. So I guess the first thing it would need to do is to actually connect to Gmail's server, perform some kind of handshake, establish a connection, establish the SSL certificate key stuff. Alright, get all that out of the way. Now we trust each other, now we can talk. And now, we're not logged in. We're just able to talk. Now, this is his login page mind you, that we're trying to connect to, but we first have to establish the keys and be able to talk. Now, we send in the login form data. Most likely just our email address and we click next. And then it asks for the password, we enter that, we click next. Now, it verifies a, a, uh, a match for email and password. And Then it will send us back a cookie. I think. Indicating that we are now a logged in user. Not even sure if we need anything with that cookie, but what I can say is once you establish that socket connection, I think you're good to go. I don't even know if you need anything cookie related, but I would want to uh, hmm. I guess we'd be receiving those login pages though, and we'd be not displaying them though, but we'd be identifying them, and we'd be responding with HTT POST commands, I guess, where we uh, enter in our form submissions, so username and password. Alright, so at, 
after username and password, I'm guessing they send us back a cookie. And then from there, we need to uh, go to the inbox URL page, I guess. Well, no, they'd probably send us that page after the successful login. They, they would send us there, I think. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it just say you've successfully logged into Google services. Maybe it would be some kind of splash page. I don't know. So probably the next move once we're logged in is we're logged into Google. Now we go to the Gmail inbox page. And now we look for a payment received email. So that's the overall view of what's going to be happening here. So now we can start writing up that. Um, so once we're to the email inbox page, we're going to check for payment received email by reading through the list of all the emails based on sender ID and email title. So we'll read that list, which will be returned to us in the form of an HTML page with the listing of all the emails on our inbox. If we don't see a payment received email there, we go to a, I don't know, one minute delay, and then we check again. We we request the inbox page again. Uh, so that's kind of like a page refresh. And then we check again. If we don't find it, wait 60 seconds, refresh again, rinse, repeat. If we find it, well, um, a title that says payment received in in the wording then we know we just received money through PayPal whether it's an eBay sale or a sale on our website or even a donation from StreamTip we know that we got a payment and it will then open that email and it will parse out the contents of the email, paste that into a TXT file in my earnings folder based upon the category of sale it is. So if it detects that it's a donation, it's going to put it in my robot project tips file. If it detects that it's an eBay sale, it's going to put it in my eBay sales folder. If it detects that it's a sale of another product I sell on my own product website, it'll put it in that respective um, earnings folder. So it will create a TXT file in the correct folder and then it will parse out the transaction ID and the dollar amount and it will put that in my earnings tallying log for that year, 2018 earnings tallying log. And it will put it in the correct column of that TXT file. Once it's recorded both of those things, it will then, if it's a certain type of receipt, um, it will actually create a JPEG image of a shipping label. And... I guess it can create a folder or or just stick it on the desktop in general. I don't think I wanted to delete my emails though. I'd, I'd still think I should see them myself. So then my job would be to open those emails instead of copying that information into my earnings folders and copying it into my earnings tallying log for the year. That already be automated 
Uh, I would just see it, and I would need to um, locate the shipping label that was auto-generated and print it, and then I can delete the email. And I could also kind of just maybe glance through the earnings tallying log to make sure they're all accounted for to see to it that my bot is actually doing its job. And also I'd like the bot to mark these things as red so that I can see that it was most likely recorded. If it didn't mark it as red, then I wouldn't even know if the bot has handled it yet because there's a one minute delay on the bot. So that's the that's the work load. Okay. Um that's the that's like the engine loop, the main loop. I just described it all. We'll have a third person view, uh most likely. Well, yeah, probably third person. We'll probably do third person for single player story. And then we'll probably do first person for the actual FPS multiplayer mode. But maybe you can swap between first and third, depending on your preference. Some games let you do that, I think. I don't want a team of coders. I'm an alpha male. I do it all myself. I'm not going to eat any more food for like the next two days. My code cannot be hacked. Well, maybe it can. Uh, okay, so... Where to begin? Um, well, supposing this is just starting, first thing we need to do log into Gmail. Out equals true.
I'm just writing high level tasks. It's kind of like pseudocode. Almost like an outline of the algorithm. And then it, it's going to start all over again, pull contents of Gmail inbox. Alright, so that's the whole loop, guys. All just laid out. Log into Gmail account. Once that's done, pull contents of Gmail inbox. Once that's done, parse out list of email titles from Gmail inbox page. Once that's done, Process any payment received emails. Once that's done, wait for one minute and then start over. Pull contents of Gmail inbox. So once every minute, it's going to pull the contents of the inbox, look for any emails that say payment received in the title. If it discovers any like that, it's going to process them. Now, processing will involve, as I said, recording that a copy of that email in my earnings file of the the 
the correct earnings file based on the type of earning. I have different folders for different types of earnings. And then um, copying the transaction ID and the dollar amount and the date into my earnings tallying log, which is a TXT file. And then it will also create a shipping label JPEG for me to print out um, to actually ship out that order. So that will save me a little time as well. And that's that. So that's the pseudocode, or, or not, I won't call it pseudocode, it's real code, but um, it's just each time it's supposed to do something, it just is blank right now. So I have to actually fill those all in. But it's nice having your layout, a nice, clear, easy to follow, simple layout like this. Um, so a lot of times I like to take the actions and just move them to the bottom of the section. So we'll do that first. Uh, kind of like functions, you, you take them out so it doesn't get too long. So it says log into Gmail account, and then you come down to here and log into Gmail account completed. Full contents of Gmail inbox, where it actually does that, we move that out of the way. Put it at the bottom. So these basically are like functions, but they're just all booleans instead. But they're acting in the same way. I just don't prefer to use functions, I'd rather just use booleans all in my huge while loop. Um, okay, boom, boom, boom. Okay. I'm not gonna finish off that food. I'm not gonna eat until dinner tomorrow night. Not even gonna snack. Um, I'm not hungry, and that's the thing, when you eat 8,000 calories, you, you don't actually feel hungry for like a day or two, like two days. It stays with you for a very long time. Your body knows. Oh, it has nothing to do with guilt. If you ate a salad for lunch, you'd be starving by now, right? It's been, what, 10 hours? But if you eat a 7 or 8 or 10,000 calorie meal, you're not going to be hungry in f the normal 4 or 5 hours. You're going to be hungry at days later. I'm telling you, if you guys ever put a, put in a meal that level of calories, you're not going to be hungry for a very, very long time. So, body's no idiot. Okay, so log into Gmail account. Um, see, that's a that's a smaller task. It's kind of overwhelming when it's like, what do I do? Email receipt puller bot. That's very high level. This is a lower level task. Log into Gmail account. So now we can break this down into a series of subtasks as well. Um, log into Gmail account. Well, first thing I want to do is determine where to even go. What's the URL of that? You know, so I'm gonna actually see. This is the page you want. Let me show it actually. Um, this is the page I want to get to, to log into my email. The actual like you, nobody ever really sees this page, because this page presumes you have no accounts sit, stored at all in cookies. And it assumes that you're just completely signed out of everything in Google. This is the very baseline page you can get to. And if you look at this URL, it's very long. 